As you can see, we're starting a new series. A sergeant major was inspecting the troops one morning when he saw a new soldier that he didn't recognize. The sergeant major yelled, hey you, private, get over here and tell me your name. The private came running over and said, my name is John. Ooh, the sergeant major was upset. John, what kind of army do you think this is? John, what kind of response do you think that is? From now on, don't you ever give me your first name. In my army, we call my soldiers by their last name, such as Smith or Jones or Jenkins or Martinez. From now on, you need to start addressing me with respect. If you start your answer with sir, you end it with sir. So again, tell me, Private, what is your name? To which the Private replied, Sir, my name is Darling John. Darling, sir. <laughs> Sergeant Major looked at him and said, Okay, Private John, here's what I need you to do. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I recently read about a man with an extremely unusual name. He went to the doctor's office. The receptionist looked at his name, was puzzled how to pronounce it. He said, Wow, that's a name you don't hear every day. Man looked really puzzled and said, well, yes, I do. <laughs> you know, names can be funny. They can be hard to pronounce. They can be common, like John. I mean, you look on the Internet, John, there claims to be over 5 million men in the United States of America who are named John. They might be very rare names, like my first name. And it's spelled the way my name is. The Internet says there's only one in the entire United States with this name. <laughs> only one. Some people know what their names mean. Some people have no idea what their names mean. Today we're starting a new series. It's going to be taking us through the end of the year. We're going to be looking at names. What's in a name? Now, I get to start this new series by preaching mainly from Genesis 5, where there's a long genealogical list of the generations from Adam to Noah. Hopefully you have prepared yourself for today's sermon. You have read Genesis 5 prior to coming in here. But let, me, let us prepare ourselves even further with prayer right now. Let's pray. Lord, I am so thankful for the privilege of coming to know you and to know you as our Lord and Savior. I thank you, Lord, for the scriptures. And Lord, help us as we look at this passage, a bunch of names that some of us really struggle to pronounce. Help us to see it as more than just names. Help us to learn what we're being taught here. Lord, thank you. Let your Holy Spirit speak to each one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Years ago, I got interested in some of the meanings of the Bible names, and I ran across a study of the ten generations from Adam to Noah. What their names meant, how important they were. Today, I want to share that information with you uh, and help us to learn some even other things from uh, Genesis 5. So we're going to get started. Adam to Noah. Adam to Noah. Let me get the clicker going here. There we go. Adam to Noah. Most of us know the story of creation, how God on the sixth day formed Adam from the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. We know about Adam's creation, but have we actually thought about the meaning of his name? Because it's really simple, Adam literally means man or mankind. That's what his name meant. Adam's the first man, according to Scripture, and I believe the Scripture. I know there are people who don't believe God's Word, thus they don't believe Adam was actually the first human being. But the Word of God, God who knows all things, revealed to us that God created Adam from the ground. He breathed into him life, and Adam is the first man, and thus he's given a name that is more of a description of what he is. Man, the start of mankind. And we can read in Genesis 4 how that Adam had relations with his wife Eve, whom God created out of a rib from Adam's side. And Eve gave birth to a son. They named him Cain, which name meant striker, because when Adam and Eve sinned, God talked about a curse that was going to come upon, upon them, and how that from their seed, from her seed, there would be one who would strike the head of Satan, and they would bruise the heel. So guess what they named their first son? Cain, striker. He's going to be the one who's going to strike that that, that uh, uh, serpent. Uh, Eve later gives birth to a, a son named Abel. And as the Bible con account continues, Cain kills his brother Abel. But neither Cain nor Abel are brought up in the generations that are listed from G in Genesis 5 that goes from Adam all the way down to Noah. In this lineage, the next important generation, the next generation, one child of theirs, is Seth. And Seth literally means appointed 
Or some translators think it means like a substitute in place of. Some people look at this and the fact that, that Abel has died and God has given them another child, a substitute, one that's appointed to take his place, basically. And so they look at that and kind of consider that. In fact, that is brought up in Genesis chapter 4, verse 25, when Eve says of Seth, God has appointed me another offspring in place of Abel, for Cain has killed him. Names were given for specific purposes. So let's continue looking at these names of the first 10 generations. We've looked at Adam, we've looked at Seth. Next one is Enosh. Enosh means mortal or mortality. To me, that's a really odd name to name your child, but that's what Seth and his wife, they named their son, Enosh, one of their sons. Enosh then fathers a child that's gonna be named Kenan. Kenan literally means sorrow. It can be a dirge of a song, a sorrowful song, anything that expressed sadness. And some translators think it might also mean a dwelling or even a possession, but most of them lean towards sorrow and sadness. And then comes Mahaliel. Mahaliel, which literally means God be praised. From sadness to sorrow to praising the Lord God. Apparently, Kenan was absolutely tired of being associated with sorrow and sadness. He wanted something much better for his son. Let's be God be praised. And then we've come to a name that most of us here at this congregation are very familiar with, especially the guy sitting back there in the corner, Jared, uh, our fellow minister here. Jared's name in the Hebrew literally comes down to meaning descent, or he shall descend, he shall come down. I find it interesting, this flow from Kenan, sorrow, being down in the dumps, to Mahaliel, God be praised. This is, everything's going good. We're way up high. And then we come back to Jared, that he, he, things are coming back down off that mountaintop. And then we get to Enoch. Enoch literally means to teach or train. And as we read about Enoch, we find a man who wanted to live so completely holy to the Lord God, so much so that it tells that he walked with God and was taken up to be with the Lord, never talking about him dying. It's an amazing blurb about him. Enoch then fathered Methuselah. Methuselah has a name that has two distinct definitions, one being death shall bring judgment, or the other one being man of spear. I guess those definitions can have a crossover uh, dealing with dying by the spear as a judgment, but I don't really see how else they interlap so much so that different Hebrew scholars have different ideas of the meaning of the same name. Yet Methuselah is the only man that is mentioned who lives to the age of 969 years. And then what's really weird about him, even though he lives to be 969, no one else lives any longer than that, he dies before his dad does. His dad didn't die. He walked with God and <laughs> did die. Some of you are trying to sit there, no, Malcolm, I think you got something wrong. No, no, he, his dad didn't die. After Methuselah, Methuselah fathers Lamech. A name from which we get our word lament or despair, and that's what this is. And I wonder if Methuselah was starting to see all the growing evil in the world when he fathered Lamech, and thus he gave him this name. He was despairing, he was lamenting about the condition of the world. What was it becoming? I don't know. And Lamech uh, fathers then Noah, a man we probably heard about with Noah in the ark. His name literally means rest or comfort. But I bring up all these names and their meanings because the meanings actually seem to tell us God's plan. If you put these meanings together, you know, we start with Adam, mankind. Mankind is appointed mortality or sorrow. But God be praised. He, speaking about God, in the form of Jesus, he shall descend and teach and train us. His death shall bring about judgment, even pierced by a man with a spear, in order to allow us to lament, to repent, to despair of our sins, and come into the rest and comfort that God offers us. Ten names. When you look at their meanings, it tells us the gospel story. God's plan that after we sin would bring in death, that God himself would have to come in the very form of Jesus to die on a cross, taking our judgment so we could be rid of our sins, so we could again have peace and comfort with God. Genesis 5 is a list of 10 generations from Adam to Noah, but it's also a quick telling of the plan of God for salvation, a lesson that the Hebrew people would have picked up on right away because they knew what those names mean. But for us who don't speak Hebrew, we don't really catch it very often. Have to have it kind of explained to us. 
But in Genesis 5, even though we got all these names and their, their meaning, and it really had, tells us this gospel story, there's three other things that I think are very important for us to notice. First of all, what I call the surety of death. The end of verse 5, the end of verse 8, the end of verse 11, the end of verse 14, the end of verse 17, the end of verse 20, the end of verse 27, the end of verse 31. Eight times in this chapter we read that they all died. All of them except Enoch, who walks with God, and later on we'll read about Noah. He dies. It says they all died. For all but Enoch, it says they died. Death is inevitable. Even when men could live for hundreds of years, they died. And although it doesn't tell us in Genesis 5 of Noah dying, we can read about that in Genesis chapter 9, verse 29, that Noah died. Sometimes we live, though, like we think we're never going to die. But death came about because of Adam's sin. Now, there's some people who are going to immediately say, no, it wasn't Adam's sin, it was Eve's sin. And blame women, blame women. But I hate to tell you, if you look in the New Testament, and Paul's writing, Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 21, Paul makes it very clear that death entered into this world through one man, through the first Adam, this Adam. And God gave clear instructions to Adam and Eve not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because if they did, death would come. Satan tried to get Eve and probably Adam, who was probably right there beside her, to doubt God's word. Oh, God didn't really mean what he said. He didn't really mean that if you eat of this, you're going to die. He, he, he had some other thing. And Satan has been playing lies to us ever since. I know this lie here quite often. Well, yeah, we know the Bible. God's word says that death entered into the world through the sin of Adam and Eve. But that's not really true. There's millions of years when animals and people were dying and evolving into different creatures long before Adam and Eve. And every time I hear that, I have to say, excuse me, Satan. God knew what he said. And he meant what he said. There was no death before Adam and Eve sinned. And that means evolution can't be true because there wasn't all these dying and dying and other things. The evolution can't be true because death came into the world when Adam and Eve sinned. Not before that. But because they did sin, we have death now. And even though there's a couple exceptions of people who did not die, Enoch, as we read about him, he walked with God and he did not die. Later on, we're going to read about a guy named, a, a prophet named Elijah, who gets taken up in a chariot of fire and he doesn't die. Other than those two, pretty much everybody else, guess what we do? We die. Unless Jesus comes back first, we're going to die. Death's a sure thing. Genesis 5 proves it time and time again. It speaks of these patriarchs, these ten generations. They died. The second thing in Genesis 5 that makes it very clear is the shortness of life. And some of you are going like, Malcolm, this is not the chapter to prove shortness of life. <laughs> There's people here who live as long as 969, not your 33 years or whatever it is for you. <laughs> 969, but even the people who lived in 969, they all died. They all died. Adam lived to be 930, Seth 912, Enish 905, Kenan 910, Mahaliel made it to 895, Jared bounced back up 962, Enoch lived only for 30, 365 years in this world before he never died, went up to heaven, Methuselah, like I said, made it to 969, Lamech 777 before the flood came, and then Noah, who survives the flood, he ends up living to be 950 years old. And whether they lived 777 years or 900 169 years, these men, with the exception of Enoch, they all died. And even though we look at their lives as a long time, in the grand scheme of the universe, they're a small portion. None of them lived through from the Garden of Eden to today. None of them lived from the Garden of Eden to the time of the birth of Jesus. None of them lived from the, the, the Garden of Eden to King David or King Saul. They all died many years before. Because life, even if you could live to be a thousand years old, life is 
short. We have no idea how long we will live. Uh, if you go on the internet, the Center for Disease Control claims the average life expectancy for a male is 74.8 years. For a female, 80.2 years. And for some reason, they don't have the average life expectancies of any of the other made-up genders. <laughs> they, only, they only got those two genders. <laughs> But even with those average life expectancies, there's no guarantee we're going to live that long. I remember several years back, I had an uncle, passed away at age 55. And I was going like, oh, wow, I'm not very far from there. A couple of years later, I had a cousin, died at age 55. I'm going like, ooh. The next year, I had another cousin die at age 55. And I was 54. And I was going like, I don't like the idea of getting close to 55. I actually made it past 55, but I remember some amp, app, apprehension about turning 55. I remember uh, my parents talking to me about how the, they were expecting to die soon. And so we had this big family vacation where we all went there because they were all certain that they were going to die soon. And, and dad had all these plans, you know, I'll probably die before mom. And so we got to take care of this. And so we went about another 10 years. We had another big family vacation where we'd all get together because it was going to be our last vacation together. And dad was again talking about how he was going to die. And then mom would die later on. And what do you know? Mom died first. And a few late years later, my dad passed away last year. We never know how long we're going to live. And Genesis 5 points that out to us. We don't know how long. Even when looking at these people live 700, 800, 900, almost 1,000 years, they all died without knowing exactly how old they were going to be when they would die or how young. Genesis 5 lets us know the surety of death, the shortness of life, and finally, the security of eternal life. Enoch is the only one of these men for whom it says he walked with God and was not. He had no death. He had no death. God took him to eternal life. There are books, there are movies that ask questions about if eternity, if heaven is real. People debate the topic. Some people live their lives as if they don't believe in heaven, they don't believe in eternity, all the way up until they get sick and they're on their deathbed or in the hospice care. And then they want to get their lives prepared in case there is a heaven. But God, from early on in his scriptures, wanted us to know that heaven is real. There really is an eternal destiny for people. Jesus came, he plainly taught us there's an eternal destiny for all people. When he taught the throne judgment in Matthew chapter 25, he made it extremely clear that one day there's going to be a separation as a shepherd separates his sheep from his goats. And there will, Jesus will say to the ones on the left, depart from me, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and for his angels. To those on his right, he's going to declare, come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom that has been prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And again, the righteous are going to go to eternal life. And again, he says, the wicked are going to go to an eternal punishment. But the eternal of one is the eternal of the other. But in Jesus, when we walk by faith like Enoch, we can have a security of an eternal life with God in heaven. Even John writes about this. 1 John chapter 5. We can know. We can know that we have eternal life. It's not just a hope. It's not just a shot in the dark. It's not just an impossibility. It's not, well, I'm just hoping it might happen. It is guaranteed. It is secure. And Enoch walked with God and was not. He went directly to eternal life. Not pass and go. Definitely not going to jail. He went straight to be with God. And Genesis 5 reveals this very plainly. But the real question it all comes down to is, are you prepared by walking with God? Are you walking with God so that if your eternity began today, would you know for certain that you're going to spend eternity in His presence in heaven forever? In that great judgment scene that Jesus spoke about in Matthew chapter 25, the people are separated from what they've been doing or not doing for Jesus, even to the least of these. Feeding the hungry, 
giving drink to the thirsty, inviting in the strangers, clothing the naked, visiting the sick and in prison? Does your life demonstrate love in action? It's amazing how God plans things. I had this sermon written uh, almost three weeks ago. And guess who's here this weekend? Ides, who goes out and does these things, takes care of people in emergency situations. But you know, for most of us, we can't say we've been perfect at demonstrating God's love. We truly need forgiveness of our sins, and that is exactly what God knew when he lists for us these ten generations here in Genesis 5. I hope you notice that there was nothing that was said about these men in these generations, that they were the firstborn of each, each of their fathers. In fact, it's very obvious they weren't. Genesis 4, Adam. Who's his firstborn? Cain. Then he has Abel. And later on, he has Seth. Seth's not his firstborn. And then when you look at these children, it's probably not their firstborns. It's just that he brought these ones up because these ones are the generations from Adam all the way down to Noah. And it's amazing how God used their names to reveal his plan of salvation. Mankind is appointed mortality and sorrow, but God be praised. He, God, speaking in the very form of Jesus, God, Jesus will descend. He will teach and train us. His death is going to bring about judgment, even pierced by a man with a spear, to allow us to repent, to lament, to despair of our sins, and come back into a rest and a comfort with, that God offers. God knew every one of us was going to sin. Ephesians chapter 1 plainly teaches that God's plan of salvation that would be through His Son, Jesus, by the blood of Jesus shed for our sins was God's plan from before the foundation of the world. Long before we ever sinned. Long before Adam and Eve ever sinned. Long before these ten generations that are listed for us. God knew we were going to sin. We would have death. But God had a plan to save us that he would come down in the very form of a human being, Jesus. He would live and die for our sins. He would take on our penalty, our judgment for our sin so we could repent. We could lament. We can come back to him and have a peace and a comfort with God by the blood of Jesus. What a beautiful picture. And I would guess that most of you, when you have read Genesis 5 before, all you looked at was a horrible chapter with a bunch of names that you could struggle to pronounce. But God was giving us a great lesson. He was teaching us His divine plan, the surety of death, shortness of life, and the security of an eternal life by walking with God. The choice is, will you accept His grace and forgiveness through His Son, Jesus, who descended to earth to save us? Will you believe in Him? Will you repent of your sins? Will you confess Jesus to be your Lord and Master? Will you put to death the old man of sin in the waters of baptism to rise up as a new creature in Christ? Will you begin your walk with God and continue your walk with God? Lord, I ask that each one of us here would make sure that we surrender completely to You in every area. Thank you for revealing your plan from back at the beginning of creation. Help us to live faithful for you. Help us to trust you. Help us to surrender in every part of our lives to you. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. On a global scale, disasters are imminent. People affected by either natural or man-made disasters often don't think that those situations can happen to them. But when disaster does strike, those affected often feel helpless with nowhere to turn to in time of need. Since 1973, the International Disaster Emergency Service has been serving globally to meet people's physical and spiritual needs. Our focus areas of disaster response, hunger relief, community development, and medical care all center around our main focus of evangelism by showing the love of Christ to those affected by disasters or are in desperate situations. IDES has been part of God's work in the most difficult times of people's lives. When there was no food in the middle of a drought, when there was no clean water, when homes were destroyed, and when life-saving surgeries were needed, we've seen God work through His people to respond to those who are hurting with help and hope. And this is why we exist. As we embark on our next 50 years, IDES is expanding help and hope to include international field workers, strategically planning churches and communities we help, and a commitment to leadership training and disciple-making. We invite you 
to be a part of what God is doing. I just want to say, start by saying thank you. Thank you so much because uh, you guys can give $450 a month and have for a long time. You guys have been long time partners of I. Um, so the first thing I just want to say is thank you for that. Thank you for entrusting to us. And um, I, I also believe that it's important for a mission to come and be able to share you know, what they're doing with those who are giving as part of good stewardship. Uh, so I appreciate the privilege to even come out here. If you ever find yourselves near Indianapolis, I don't know why you would from out here, but if you ever find yourself there, pop in on us. We love guests, we love visitors showing up there and being able to show you around uh, our warehouse and all the We've been around for 51 years. So we've been doing this a long time. We have partnerships um, in 134 countries that we've worked in, hundreds of partners, our own field workers also living overseas as well. Um, and we do three things. If, if, if you listen to that video, if you remember three Ds, disaster response, development, and disciple making. That's our part. Disaster response is, is what we're known for because it's in our name. And whenever the big disasters happen, that's when people think of us. And disasters are, are also man-made. Uh, so Ukraine and the people that are suffering in Ukraine right in Myanmar and Thailand with the refugees, there's a coup in Myanmar that's been going on for over a year. Um, the way it's affected people and the refugees. Um, as well as natural disasters. disasters. Uh, right now we're dealing with um, Hurricane Helene. Um, I'll share about that here in a second, but uh, keep that on your mind. Uh, also remember this. There's a lot of disasters that happen around the world that you never hear about. They don't make our news cycles. There's a lot of needs out there. We're responding to them because we just have some incredible missionary partners and teams that are out there. Development. Development work is community development. And this is the idea of teach a man to fish instead of give a man to fish. So this is sustainability. This is clean water projects like you saw the wells there. This is medical care. Um, this includes livestock and farm training, which is an incredible opportunity to be able to help people be self-sufficient right where they are. We have some amazing, amazing partners over in Africa. And we were constantly responding to hunger relief in a drought-stricken area of Kenya. Uh, and as we worked there, uh, they said, hey, we have this idea for these farms, these irrigated farms, and to teach this uh, to people who live here. And so we said, all right, well, let's do this. And so we put one in, and the next year there was a drought again, and we reached out and we said, hey, what can we do? And they said, actually, more time. Because they all farm this land that was given to them, and they all have enough food for themselves, and they even have enough to sell to provide other things for their families as well. How about we just build more? So we built over 40 farms um, to a price tag of fifteen to $17,000 a piece that Really, a well and a pump and everything to make that happen. Uh, different ministers of the churches there, they leave these farms and people have to come work it. If you don't work it, you don't get it. They work their plot there. Uh, but it's all thousands of people. That's sustainability, that's development work. And inside of that, that's the core of everything. When we respond to a disaster, when we help with clean water, mental care, hunger relief, you name it, it's for that purpose. Our mission is to meet the physical, and spiritual needs of suffering people around and hope. And the two go together. And over and over we see that being people's physical needs opens the door. So we also have pastoral leadership training, uh, trainings that we do around the world, uh, as well as uh, setting up learning centers right now for good theological training for folks who live in other countries and being able to make sure they have the, the gospel, that they have the Bible. The one you didn't hear about was the massive typhoon that went through Southeast Asia and affected numerous countries, Thailand, Myanmar, other countries, Laos over there. 
and um, just people underwater. And so while we're responding here, we're also responding over there. I say that because that also means while we're responding here, you're responding here. Um, and while we're responding over there, you're responding over there. You guys are a part of what we do. What we do couldn't happen without you guys and your partnership, your financial partnership and your prayers. Thank you so much for that. Right now, I've got teams in Florida uh, working with uh, Hurricane Helene response that just went through. Um, they're in the live oak area. That's right where the storm came on. And it's a lot of wind damage and torn down trees and roofs and everything else. And then we're getting ready to stage just south of there where a lot of floodwaters came in in St. Petersburg and just flooded. And so as those waters go down and then the insurance comes in, we'll be able to come in and do cutouts and dryouts and At the same time while we're doing that, this, this hurricane the lead was different. I know you've watched the news and you've seen it, so you know it. But instead of veering off like it normally does, it cut up to the Midwest and just parked and dumped water, especially on Tennessee and North Carolina. So we've got teams there right now. I was just actually out here. Uh, I'm not going to walk that. I was on the phone trying to get a hold of our disaster coordinator, not because I lost my name tag in our car, <laughs> as we were joking about, uh, but because uh, trying to make contact with them and see what they were doing. Um, so we have teams in Tennessee right now, and we're working with a coalition of churches there um, that are trying to meet the needs uh, right along the North Carolina-Tennessee border where it's most affected. Uh, and then we've got a church just south of Ashton, uh, Oak Grove Christian Church that we're also working with. In the midst of that, if you caught the news, Tropical Storm Milton is supposed to turn into a hurricane and go straight across the Gulf, right into Florida, and go across Florida. It's going to hit pretty close to where, um, actually just a little south of uh, where so our team's are there, so they're ready to move in there and be able to help those folks as well. Um, but that's who we are, that's what we do, that's what we're doing right now. And so I appreciate what you guys do. One of the things I love is the question, why? We get asked that question a lot on the disaster sites. And, and the question, why, opens up the door to be able to, to answer why, maybe on a deeper level than what people thought. Last year, we responded for, for 18 months, 19 months, 20 months, 20 months, to Hurricane Ian down in Florida. And Milton's going right for that same spot, by the way, where Ian was. Uh, we responded with New Day Christian Church and met a number of other churches and met a whole lot of needs. New Day baptized over 500 people in the course of that 20 months. And they attribute that to the relief work that they and we were a part of, meeting the needs of their community. But I think one of my disaster coordinators, as he was telling me, David, we, we were working on this home of this guy, and he walked out, and the volunteers were there, and our volunteers come from all over the place. They come from the west and the south and the north and everywhere. And they so, if you ever want to get out of the heat, if you ever want to get out of the dry heat, I can probably put you to some wet heat over the middle of that. If, if you want to change the scenery a little bit, grab a hand come on over and put you to work. But he said, hey, the homeowner came out and he, he asked the, the volunteers who were there, he said, why are you here? Well, we know that your roof's damaged, and if we don't get something on it, if we don't take care of it, it's just going to get worse, and, and you're not going to be able to be put back together. My executive coordinator, Rich is somewhat of a rough, very to the point sort of man, he stepped in and he said, Well, it's because we're Christians. It's what we do. Oh, that's a great answer. That's a great answer. And this man said, I've been an atheist my entire life. But if this is what Christians do, I might have to give this church thing. And he said, David, that guy's been at church the last three weeks. Yeah. At church. That's what this is about. Because I guarantee you that a week and a half before Hurricane Eden came through there, if anybody from the church or volunteers had gone and wanted to just share the gospel, that conversation probably wouldn't have happened. But when the storm comes through and blows down your house, it also tends to blow down the barriers that you have 
when people are there showing me the love of Christ. And it opens the door to conversation. We see this story over and over here in the U.S. and around the world. Thank you. Thank you so much for being a part of the meetings right here and all over the world. I'm, I'm hanging out here for a little bit. So if you guys have questions, uh, actually, I can ask right now. If you guys have any questions about what we do or what we're doing, They're just, they're on top of each other, the shipments that go out, the materials that need to be sent out. 
So we're getting ready to launch our first um, multi-million dollar campaign uh, to add some additional office space, but double our warehouse space that each of them can have their own space. For us, we haven't even shared this publicly at all. Um, we visited with just a couple of people, but we're, we're starting a $6.3 million campaign. On the one hand, I know what I'm going to provide, because it's a big need. We see the need 